so we'll stop. Thank you. Hello, Miami. I'm so excited. I always wanted to say that. <laughs> Hello. While I find my screen, I'm going to give a shout out to my scribes down in Florida that I use at work with Scribe America, who I talk to almost every day. And I have no idea where my screen is. Oh, there it is. Okay. Can you see my screen? Probably not. Not yet. Okay. So share screen. Do this again. One more time. Sorry, y'all. Advanced. I guess you do have to set it up again. Here we go. It's asking me for a password. I don't know why. Um, let's see. Pause for some technical difficulties. <laughs> I don't know why it's asking me. All set up before we started, but then it. Is it working now? See it now. I see your I... screen. You see it? Yes, looks yes. good. Great. All right. So, yes, I'm sorry about your guys' hurricane yesterday. And I'm sorry that I didn't have a scribe for two hours at work, too, while I had two big intracerebral hemorrhages. <laughs> That was really sad um, for all of us. So I'm just gonna start right here. So I've been a surf doctor for about 14 years and I've got a lot of experiences to share with all of you and also some scary stories as well. Um, really me finding surf doctoring was really about finding a work-life balance for myself, which I didn't have as a third year resident. I had always lived near the ocean. I love the ocean, but surfing wasn't really something I discovered until later in life. Actually didn't discover it till I was 32. So she talked a little bit already about how all the places that I've journeyed to. So I'll just go right on in. So when I was in medical school, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I left everything open. I was watching the show ER like everyone else was. And I just thought it was the most interesting field. When I was in medical school at Keck, we had the LA County USC trauma room right next to us. I'm sure you guys have seen um, Code Black before. It was a super exciting um, place to work and we would go over there frequently during medical school and have lectures and, and I just thought it was the most exciting place to be. So really um, my push here is for you to be passionate about what you choose. Make sure you wanna spend a majority of your time there. For instance, if you wanna be a surgeon, make sure that you like to stand on your feet for six hours. Um, I, after about six hours, I was done with the theater. And then, you know, other options obviously were weeded out along the way. For instance, pediatrics, I couldn't stand parents. <laughs> but you really just find out what you love and just go for it. And that's what I did. I ER fit for me for, I wanted free time. I wanted really intense, hardworking work time. And that um, was really the only specialty I envisioned myself in. So I loved training at the county hospital because it was a level, level one trauma center. We had specialties from all around the world. We had premier toxicologists and uh, we had the, what I consider the best ER doctors in the world training us, Dr. Billy Mallon, Stuart Swadron, our um, ED director there at the time um, was Dr. Newton. And the other reason I chose it was because of the international opportunities. We, as a group of residents went to Bhutan and Bhutan's a pretty special place because they measure their gross happiness and not just in money, but in how the people live and enjoy their lives. It is covered in marijuana. So I think that probably is part of it, why they're happy all the time. And men wear skirts and shoot bows and arrows and they seem to really enjoy themselves. They are very basic. Um, They're very much part of the environment. When we were there uh, with the other residents, we went to Timpu and we... Um, learned about their medicine. And we also talked about how we worked as ER physicians in the US. And then went on for a couple day trip. We hiked 16 miles, met the minister of health who was on, a, on the 16 mile hike, who was greeting the people of his country, which is pretty amazing. Uh, we did end up covered at leeches by the end of that trip up at the top of a monastery with monks. And that is where I learned about leeches, which is also a very effective treatment um, for growth that they actually use at LA County for a lot of injuries. Um, other opportunities I had with LA County, which 
I loved were when I finished residency for a month, we went to Africa, to Accra, Ghana, and we actually taught emergency medicine to the doctors there. It's an unusual place. This is an ER uh, room right there. They use ambulances as taxis, I mean, taxis as ambulances. And during this conference, you can see Dr. Stuart Swadron right here in this picture, and he's teaching a large group of doctors about emergency medicine. We taught them how to put central lines in. And then we spent the next days after the conference, you know, going on safari to Botswana and going to South Africa and Mali and Tanzania and Zanzibar and Egypt. So it was pretty amazing to be able to combine medicine and travel and really feel like you're making an impact on an ER in a remote place that doesn't really have ER medicine. It's a young specialty. It's only been around 30 or so years. So a lot of underdeveloped countries don't have access and don't have ER doctors really, they just have specialists. So what happened to me in my third year resident? I was completely burnt out. I literally was about to quit. I found this program in, called Surf Divas in Mexico where it was a, a group of women from all different professionals and walks of life. And it brought joy back to my life. I was very depressed. I was pale. I was under exercised. I was overeating. And this really gave me the fuel for the fire of my professional life. I attended this camp, learned yoga, surfing, and I was 32, so it was pretty late to be learning to surf. But this was really the therapy that saved me from drowning as a doctor in training. And I hope that all you find what keeps you able to do that in residency, because it's a lot different from medical school. Medical school is a big party <laughs> compared to residency. It's a little different now. You don't have the 120 hour plus weeks that we did and when we walked in the snow, but you, know, you still have, um, a lot of work to do and have to cut out your free time. So really the motto of this um, company, uh, Surf Divas, was basically teaching people that the, the best surfer in the water is the one having the most fun. And that's really what I tried to take back with me is my sense of personal joy and really um, just use it as something to do in my time off so I could recharge and have passion for my career again. So back to reality, back in ER, I. Um, became an attending fresh out of res residency diapers and then went to the closest hospital. It was a level two trauma center. And the great place, great part about this is it's, um, there's, a, there's a safety net there. I feel like backup is important for the first few years. I worked at a facility where my residency attendings were moonlighting as ER doctors. There's already always double coverage. And if I missed a spinal tap, my attending Dr. Henderson just rolled a stool over and just took over for me, which is actually pretty funny now that I look back on it. But so I really think you should go to a bigger center after your first year's residency training. Just, I call it finishing school, really. Um, community hospitals are really not for the faint hearted. Uh, I didn't attempt working at a community hospital till three years after training. And the reason you don't wanna do that right away is it's like working on an island. You literally have to manage difficult OB-GYN, neurosurgery, ENT cases without a specialist on call. You'll be YouTubing videos on how to put in super pubic catheters and treating priapism with 18 gauge needles, which believe me, you don't wanna be doing in a, especially in LA, right? We've got a very litigious population there. I didn't wanna be attempting those type of procedures without backup. Another great thing to do when you're third year residency is what I did was I worked at an urgent care. So it's a great way to get your feet wet. Um, and also you can't do much harm in an urgent care. You can spread those doctor wings. You might hit a building or two when your cape doesn't work, but that's all right. You can practice your x-ray vision because some urgent cares don't have x-ray. Always splint, no matter what, even if you don't think it's broken and when in doubt, radiate. So here's me learning to surf at age 32. I went to the most dangerous wave in the world uh, just a few years after this to cloud break in Tavarua. I landed my dream job while I was working at an urgent care training as a third year resident. Sorry, that's not when I landed my dream job. I, that's when I was moonlighting. But a few years after that, working at the urgent care, um, I basically ran into a woman who needed a surf doctor for their trip and she invited me along. So much of success I found does depend on being in the right place in the right time, but we just give it up to the universe sometimes. Um, so this was the opportunity I had, and it kind of set off my career for surf doctoring just a few years out of residency. So at this point I knew how to surf, but I was horrible and I just needed training. 
So when I went on this trip, uh, my eyes were just really open to the opportunity uh, to travel the world and practice medicine. This is the clinic in which I saved that woman's life. Uh, this is the first place we went after we scooped her out of the ocean. And when you get to a place like this, you want to get into the medic room, find out where everything is, have a master list, know where your emergency bags are you're going to grab, and learn the protocols of the of emergent patients. And, and then as soon as you've got that under your belt, you go out and you just surf your brains out. So I want to talk a little bit about the most important lessons I learned as a surf doctor over the last 14 years. Don't do anything where you can't sew yourself. In other words, only surf at high tide. Don't surf at low tide because you can't sew your back. I've had to sew my feet a few times. The most memorable, I recently posted a video of right before my first shift on Maui, I had to sew my own foot up. I highly recommend not working an entire night shift after you've just sewed your foot up. It's extremely painful. Number two, like a scout, always be prepared. Every boat ride I ever went on, I always had a bag. It had pressure dressings, Dermavon, Propericane, which numbs the eyeball, and even Zofran. Actually, my first surf trip I took to Fiji, I became extremely nauseated out at cloud break because the winds and the waves were crazy. And I ended up asking one of the surfing clients to stab my arm with Reglan because we did not have Zofran at the time. So he gave me the shot on my arm and then forgot to pull it out. So I remember pulling it out and then vomiting and feeding the fishes. So if not for your, everyone else, just be prepared for yourself really. And number three is you've got to take charge and run a wilderness emergency like you would a code. Everyone, you need to figure out everyone's skills really fast. Who's the EMTs? Who has any skills? I found there was an ob guy doctor actually when I did that rescue, I had to put the Foley in. And then you clear the room from everyone else who's just bystanders. And lastly, don't drink on the job. Even if you're at a beautiful resort and you want to have a pina colada, it's really hard to put a pin to put an IV in when you've had your third pina colada. I might know something about that. All right, my career journey. So I made these cards after my first trip to Tavarua. They said, um, expert in the unexpected will work for surf. And from there, I started looking for opportunities and meeting people at these resorts who might need me on their trips. If you don't wanna to go to the Mentawis, which are in the middle of nowhere, or to G-Land, which is even further, then another safe option is Hawaii. And I found living in California, I just kept leaving California. So I just thought I might as well move to an island. So I moved to Hawaii, but that was really after 10 years of practice or more in LA. LA is a great place to jet set off to all these places. So one of the places I went to was the Matawi Islands um, at the Kendui Resort, which had a surf doctor at the time. The problem with this location, as you can see, is it's a 12 hour boat ride to get here and helicopters don't land here. So I realized very quickly when I, you're here in the Mentawi Islands, getting out of here is near impossible with an emergent patient. I've only been there once. There's other people who might go every year, but that's, we'll have to figure out who that is. <laughs> the other place I went is to G-Land and Java Camp, Indonesia, and as well, extremely remote. Um, it took, I would say four hour car ride, overnight um, transportation, actually more than that, eight hour. And if you wanna get out of there, it's a surf helicopter, which is all very manageable, but um, you know, you might wanna just go work at, at a Costa Rica camp where you're just one hour from an emergent hospital. So these are some pictures from my travels. This one over here is from G-Land, which is an extremely organized camp. And I wanna spend some time talking about that because it, it has medical student electives for Australians. <laughs> I got you good. Just kidding. They might accept Americans. I don't know. But I worked there as a surf doctor my first time. The other, um, oh God, that's exactly what this freaking okay. And it's happening. The other place I worked at was, um, this picture over here is from a surf break called Nipusi. I did not just say a bad word. That's what it's called. So the in interesting place about, or the interesting things about G-Land is the surf camp is in the Plain Kong Nature Reserve. It's in the middle of nowhere at the edge of Gronjagon Bay. It's frequented only, almost exclusively by surfers and their need for medical ex expertise is extreme. So remote and it, there's extremely dangerous surfing conditions. So what you, what you learn on these medical school electives they have down there, which they didn't have at the time, is that for me, was you learn how to manage surfing injuries, retrieval challenges in remote location, 
increasing your knowledge of trouble med medicine and learning about public health issues. And as well, you can teach BLS to the locals and also the surfers because they might end up being someone who's gonna help you in an emerging state. I don't know if they take medical students, as I said, but if you go to surfingdoctors.com as a physician, they accept American physicians, you can go work there. And it's a great group of Australians are extremely entertaining to work with. Surf trauma. Let's talk about the most dangerous part of surfing is the high impact collisions with a reef. It's razor sharp and it has mostly living coral. Common injuries are skin lacerations, wound infections, um, marine life stings. And Lyme has no effect in killing any of the bacteria. So just don't even bother. We'll also talk about ortho procedures, dislocations, sprains, limb fractures. And then we'll, finally, we'll talk about some vascular penetrating injuries. In all cases, travel insurance is a must for yourself, for patients who come to these areas. And a lot of times, all these only these places will take cash money if you don't have travel insurance. This is an example of a skin laceration. This is the chief of Tavarua, Atha. He's an amazing surfer. I've never seen anyone take off deeper in a wave than him. He has multiple injuries. Here's some of my handiwork right here from suturing a deep laceration. Other places you have to be concerned about suturing are places over ligaments and tendons. I once had an Achilles tendon uh, laceration that went really poorly. The guy went back out surfing and had a horrible infection and then actually snapped his Achilles not too much longer after that. Can anyone name this celebrity? Let's hear it. Yes, thank you. Okay. So this is one of the greatest things about um, surf traveling is if you are a big fan of surf stars like I am, then you get to meet them, you get to take care of them. He's actually icing his wound after I... Now, Kelly told me there was coral in there. I told him I thought it was an infection. We agreed to disagree. I dug in there with a scalpel. There was no coral in there. And he missed, I can't remember what year it was. I think it was 2009. He missed the Brazil WSL part of the tour, but I'm not sure that he likes, I'm sorry, Brazil. I'm not sure that he likes going there. <laughs> Anyways, I didn't say that. So stingrays, barbs, you have to get the barbs out. I've seen so many of these. I've never had to dig a barb out. I don't x-ray them. Don't bother, just look with your eyes. They really can get infected and they cause excruciating pain. I normally would not say this. I'm sorry to all the attendings out there. I recommend beer or shots and Motrin for these. They're extremely painful. I used to give Percocet, but we're anti-opiate now. So that's my combination for success. Sea urchins, don't bother, really you're not gonna get them out. It's carbonaceous material, it's not happening. All right, Christopher, I'm counting on you. Who's a celebrity right here? Is that Andy Irons? Oh my God. I'm gonna give you a hint, Red Hot Chili Peppers. It's flea. Thank you. He loves surfing. He also likes landing on the reef like the rest of us do. This is his buddy Talk, who's an amazing longboard surfer too. He's taking care of him with Lyme. Lime is for ceviche, it's not for human flesh. It doesn't kill bacteria, it's not an effective way. I tell all the clients that I have at these surf resorts, every night you go to sleep, wash your wounds, you know, and then it'll prevent infection, you won't have a miserable time. And then put your topical antibiotics on twice a day. And also another tip, I clean with hydrogen peroxide. I don't clean with betadine. And the reason I don't clean with, oh, sorry, I should have given you a warning. I don't clean with betadine, because I have seen allergic reaction on an island and it's not pretty to put a 17 year old boy who comes in for a rash into anaphylaxis and have to give him epi and do an EKG on an island. That is not fun. So never use betadine because some people are allergic. All right, obviously you saw there's a trigger. I expect that none of you will vomit during this presentation but I, I might've vomited when I was in med school when I saw something. So I don't blame you. Fin injuries, these are the most deadly. This is a 20 year old woman. She was on her honeymoon and a long board, a long boarder who had no surfing etiquette went straight into her mouth with his fin. She basically swallowed it. Imagine when this happens in another hole in your body. I haven't seen them, but rectal lacerations involve surgical repair of intestines. I've also seen vaginal lacerations and I've had enormous leg lacerations. Why are these fins so bleepity bleep sharp? I promise you, I try not to swear. 
why do we need to cut through the wave like a knife? This is for the average surfer. Maybe Kelly Slater needs really sharp fins, we don't. So my advice is if you are a surf doctor on a trip, tell everyone to sand down their fins. It's not necessary and it'll keep you surfing and not suturing. There's a great company called 3dfins.com. I love them. They just sent me some fins and they're fantastic. And my family needs them because here's my husband, Nick. He's been surfing since he was seven. He's an amazing surfer. I've been surfing since I'm 32. Guess one of them, guess which one of us didn't end up in a level one trauma center? This girl. I met him when I was 39 surfing. He was surfing in Manhattan Beach. He'd finished surfing. He was getting out of the water. He did have his back to the wave, but he was in just a little bit of white water. I got this call when I was working at Malibu Urgent Care. The paramedics called me with his phone and they said, Dr. Myrie, we have your husband in the back of our ambulance and we're going to Harbor UCLA. And I said, wait, what about Torrance Memorial? And what about three other hospitals before the heart? Why are you going there? And they said, I said, are you going there for um, trauma reasons or vital signs? And they said both. So this is my husband. You can actually see on his wetsuit where the fin went through a cold water wetsuit into his, this is his thigh. These are the cute shorts I got him afterwards. Anyways, this is the fin. You can see where the fin actually broke off on his bone, the tip of it. A vascular surgeon had to repair him. These injuries are deadly. It could have been worse. Locations, everything. Real estate is very important where this lands on here, a couple centimeters over. I've seen another one of these on Hawaii since I've been here, same place. My husband was a little unlucky in the sense that he lost this whole muscle belly right here because it cut the nerve. So now his left leg is skinnier than his right leg, which I don't appreciate because my left leg's bigger than his left leg. Okay, here's other injuries. These are orthopedic injuries. This is actually the surf diva who taught me how to surf. This is actually a recent picture. She called me after a surf session where she had the back of the wave hit her when she was landing on the board. She dislocated and broke her ankle. She called me on FaceTime and I told her how to wrap stirrups around the bottom of her foot and pull her ankle back into place, tie it up and make it to the ER. This is her after she splinted and this is her after surgery. I really have asked my family and friends to stop injuring themselves to give me material for my slides. But I'm actually just using them because they gave me permission. And I, I obviously it's important to get permission for all these slides. Some of the less exciting things you'll see that'll drive you crazy are cerumen impaction. Everyone wants their ears washed out. Ear infections, obviously I always treat them um, when I'm surf doctoring because you don't want them to get worse. I usually don't treat them as often here in the US because I can watch them. Um, and sometimes I do that as well there too. Perforated eardrums are an issue. And then another huge issue for cold water surfers is exostosis. That is bone growth, which is encouraged from cold water exposure in your ear canal. And then of course, any place you go, you need to figure out what are the lo local public health issues? Is there malaria here? Do I need to bring pills for that? Dengue fever? Is there illicit drug use here? If I have an overdose, what kind of drugs are they taking? Um, then of course, traveler's diarrhea, parasite infections. What drugs do I need to take to kill these? Um, so I have to have a, a, just a solid surf travel bag. I actually do have one that I've been working on for a long time, but it's not ready to go. Um, then I usually go the extra mile with treatment on these trips. If someone has um, a wound I repair, I give them antibiotics for prophylaxis. You have to, it's warm, bacteria grows. Mild asthma, as I wouldn't normally give steroids, I give them steroids. Full body rashes, I sometimes give them epi because I don't wanna wait till they can't breathe. Um, so this is not the time when you're on a surf doctor trip to educate your Malibu urgent care patients about antibiotic resistance in the world. And then of course, the local population, what are you gonna see when you're there? Abscesses, gout, MIs, cholecystitis, all as a result of their poor diet, depending on what country you are in. I wanted to also go off surf doctoring a little bit and just tell you a little bit about other opportunities like ecotourism on cruise ships and also what's gonna happen when you're traveling on airplanes. I found my passion for surf diva and, surf and um, doing these camps. Um, and this is a picture of me in 2006, kind of around the same time I discovered surf doctoring. And I just want everyone to know, I was wearing a bikini and practicing medicine long before it, apparently it wasn't appropriate. And just are honestly happening to be in the right place at the right time. 
So I've had to become an expert in the unexpected. And I know traveling on, an, on a flight as a medical student is a frightening when you hear overhead. I was deep into the book, The House of God, uh, the first time when I heard the call, <laughs> the call of the wild. Is there a physician on board? I showed up in sweatpants and pigtails and the stewardess had looked at me sideways. I was responding to an asthma attack. David Hasselhoff, yes, he was on my flight. He was sitting at the bar drinking. I looked over at him and thought, this guy's probably more qualified than me. I opened up the Virgin Atlantic black box. I was on Virgin Atlantic Airlines. And I thought, what an appropriate name for this virgin doctor. And, but this was not how I want envisioned me joining the Mile High Club, but this was it. I identified the albuterol, the nebulizer machine, the steroids, and the epi. Now there was the one in 1000 epi and there was the one in 10,000 epi, but this was 2003. There was no smartphones. I either had this upstairs or I had to go back and get my book, The House of God and hope that I could find the right page. Now I keep referencing this book, which hopefully someone will write The House of Goddess, but it's written by Samuel Shem in 1978. It's a satirical novel. I suggest you all read it before you go into residency. It is fantastic. It's about medical training students in the early 1970s, and it focuses on the psychological harm and dehumanizing <laughs> caused by residency training. It coined one of my most favorite hilarious terms, which is Gomer, get out of my ER. Sorry, that's not politically correct, but it has its place. Oh, it's not working. I picked the wrong side. Okay, I want you guys all to check out. This is really funny. Can you, Sh Shilpi, can you throw this up here? Um, Yes, I can totally do that. Give me a second. This is a really, there's so many funny social media outlets you guys have that I did not have. There's practitioner, you can learn um, really interesting um, tidbits in funny fashion. You've got woke doctors for social injustice. You've got code brown memes to make fun of ourselves as healthcare workers. I literally had 300 pages of reading a night, which I would start laughing and end up crying hysterically. But you have just outlets. I didn't. I could watch ER for therapy and then talk to my best my best med school friend who would keep me off the ledge. Ledge. But you've got the Calm app and then you've also got these funny, you're going to show this video? Trying. Trying to, yes. Okay. If you can't, that's okay. Just check out. Oh, I got it. I got it. Just a funny little skit. I couldn't throw it in because I don't Can we have see it. Yeah, there it is. All right. I'm going to play it. Can you hear it? No, love that. That's okay. Read it. All right, so I just thought that was a super, so I mean, this is the stuff you guys have, this stuff's hilarious. Like I didn't have that. So I think it's just fantastic that you, you've got all these places to vent, you've got the Calm app, you can meditate. Matthew McConaughey can talk to you to back to sleep. I'm just talking because I can't see my screen, just babbling. Oh, here we go, okay. So wait, I can't see my screen. Yeah, so same thing again. Now you have to share your screen. <laughs> oh, God, this is okay. Share screen. Here we go. I'm not advanced, but I'm going to try. Are we sharing? Perfect. Are we back? Awesome. Yes, we're back. Okay, that was a lot for a little. I'm sorry, but it's really funny. Um, and I can, I'll put it on our website too for our recaps. So everyone can listen to it with the sound. So let's talk about airplane saves. I'm either, people are super lucky and I'm super unlucky, I don't know. But I just started embracing the, the um, unexpected. So if you're a surf doctor, you're gonna travel to work or you're just gonna travel, this will happen to you. You'll see the asthma overseas in London. Well, you'll have to go into the captain's quarters and talk about whether you need to land the plane and somehow end up at back at coach with a bottle of champagne, which probably doesn't happen anymore. You'll take care of a federal infant it might be your own. It was in my case. You'll get a back pain patient 
during which time hopefully you'll pretend like you're sleeping for at least a while. And then you'll also end up, as I did, taking Druku, who's this amazing, the amazing chief of Tavarua. I was taking him back, unfortunately, um, to get liver cancer treatments from Fiji to the States. And he had a drain in, um, a hepatic drain. And while I was escorting him back with my three-year-old, I get called to not one, but two emergencies. I was called to a seizure, uh, which I had to talk her through her post-ictal state, which was also my post-ictal state, I think, because I was so tired. And the other one was the back pain, which is when I, why I did pretend I was sleeping. Another time I took care of a syncope, syncope patient. I was sitting directly in front of him. I had just taken an Ambien and I was blissfully about to go deep into sleep when my husband woke me up and I'll never forgive him for this. I woke him up, I walked over to the man, I woke the man up from his syncopole event and he vomited on my socks. And then of course I had to do a full H and P on him and make sure he was okay and then figure out he was actually drunk. And then the last time was I was on a flight and Kelly Slater happened to be on it and we were all, all going to the same place and he alerted to me that I needed to go help someone with chest pain. In this case, this guy ended up going um, diving, which would not have been my first choice. And he sent me an email that he left. Having chest pain and then going diving in a remote location is not encouraged. So let's talk about eco cruises. Um, obviously an opportunity to go surfing in Mexico and other eco cruise places. Um, I would do that before and after I'd go on the cruise ship. I did put up this slide too, just to talk about another case I had. I was a third year resident driving down to Baja and I'd worked five consecutive ER night shifts and had fallen asleep. And my boyfriend woke me up to tell me that a van had flipped over in the Baja Peninsula de desert. I had to triage all of them in my bikini with a stethoscope. Grandma was about 40 feet away and she was dead. She'd flown out of the vehicle too far. 30 feet away was a neck fracture. 20 feet away was abdominal trauma with a hemoneumothorax. And the grand finale was a 15 month old with a dilated pupil who I ended up intubating when the ambulance arrived. So my friends call me a cowgirl. It's a picture of me and a horse on one of my trips to Baja. And it is a term that we use for ER doctors because you kind of have to fly by the seat of your pants a lot of times. So this is the cool uniform. Did you know as a doctor, you get to get three stripes right away on a cruise ship? I had no idea. So I had spent a lot of time in Baja surfing and a friend of mine who's also ER doctor, um, Dr. Jessica Sims told me about these. And that is just, you guys have such a great network to find out about these opportunities, but at the time it was just word of mouth. There was a hundred passengers on this, on this cruise. And that is ideal. I think going on a cruise ship with a city population of people is the worst idea. You might as well just stay in LA and work at a busy ER. So with there just being a hundred passengers, you're snorkeling with the seals, you're swimming, you're kayaking, you're hiking, you're drinking Starbucks on the bridge with the captain. It's awesome. So what do you see there? You see seal bites. What do seals do when they're mad? They're the underwater dogs of the sea. Does anyone know what they do when they're pissed off? It's what babies do when they scream too, I guess, kind of they have liquid in their mouth. Anyone? Someone said growl. Close, the underwater growl, they blow bubbles. Well, these eco cruises were full of a lot of people who had never been around seals and they thought the bubbles were cute and they'd go closer. So they got bit and seal bites are like dog bites. You have to treat them with antibiotics. Uh, they're just puncture wounds that need to be um, watched carefully. So I did a lot of just wound care there. And honestly, just took over some hangovers and some acute gastrointestinal disease. Another great benefit as a small ship is when you're friends with the captain, he takes you on tours with the, just the other people on the trip. Oh my God, I can't talk all of a sudden. And you get to swim with whale sharks. This whale came up to me first. I didn't violate anything, just so you know. Um, I kissed a whale and I liked it. And let's go to the next. So let's just run through a few entertaining cases. You can't Google the right answer. It's just two cases. And I'm gonna give a mask if someone gets the right answer. A free mask from Biology Prints. So first one, wilderness metals in the, in the city. It's a jungle out there. It's often an urban juggle deep in the city, especially in LA, because things come from all over the world to LA and you've got to be ready for it. So here's a 38 year old female. She's brought in by her EMT husband, altered mental status. She's been hallucinating since nine last night. She was with a group of girlfriends. They took a drug as a cleanse. 
Her husband says everything was okay, with, but her pupils have been blown all night and she's only been awake and alert times one. She's sweating, but stable vital signs. Her past medical history is not a big deal. It's medical marijuana, depression. And she's got a couple kids and she drinks a little and smokes. Let's get physical. Her vital signs are actually pretty stable. She's bradycardic, if anything. I wasn't impressed. But what I'm impressed with is she's agitated, she's nonverbal, and she's masturbating. And let me tell you, she was masturbating so much that we had to literally put her arms in restraints, like you would a psych patient. And we had to put two gowns on her to keep her from touching herself. It was really uncomfortable. Her pupils were two millimeters and slight, slightly reactive. And surprisingly on her shoulder, she had this lesion. She had five by five millimeter circular lesions all lined up in a row. And this is an actual picture of it. So does anyone know, any of you tropical medical geniuses out there, what caused these markings? Was it a cigarette burn laced with LSD or Molly? I don't know, I'm not very hip. Is it drug burns from the One Love cult that we recently kicked off Kauai? Is it Peruvian tree frog poison? Or is it a Pangolian bite mark infected with coronavirus? Is it too soon to make jokes about coronavirus? I feel like it's not, but, um, and I just wanna say, obviously we are all very upset and I, I, I just have to say something, obviously it's 200,000 people have died in our country and then across the country, just countless. And as well as the 7,000 healthcare workers. And I, I just want people to know that I'm sensitive to this, but humor is my medicine and this is how I get through the day. If you can't joke about it, then you're not gonna make it, especially in ER, because you see super horrible things. Okay, the winner's gonna get this cute mask. So, a few more things. We've got, the, we've got the blood trail. White blood cell count, a little bit elevated at 15. Platelets, hemoglobin are fine. Electrolytes, I'm not impressed. CK, okay, 4,000, that's not normal. It should be 100. This means her muscle cells are breaking down and she's spilling CK into her bloodstream. She's not drunk. Ammonia, so it's not hepatic encephalopathy. Lactic acid's 2.2, it's a little high, so she's in some type of metabolic acidosis. Utox, she's smoked pot, so does the rest of LA, not a surprise. Uh, sinus bradycardia, it's a little confusing for me. CT header negative, chest x-rays negative. Okay, I think I can go one more slide till, you were all free to start guessing. She had seven friends, who use matches to create superficial burns on her shoulders and apply a toxin at 2 p.m. I don't know what H means. Oh, hallucinating. Does anyone know what the toxin was? Please, in the comments, go for it. Or shout it out if you know, that's fine too. We had someone guess first, choice C, Alexandra Williams. Is well done, impressive. All right, a mask is coming your way from biology masks. So her hallucinating began at 9 p.m. along with purging. So free trog poison makes you purge. And let me tell you why. Well, the reason why is because this little guy is used by Peruvian hunters to hallucinate to hunt hunger free. And that's the origins of it. For whatever reason, it also causes them to vomit, which I'm not sure how that's gonna help them hunt for three days, but I guess they don't feel hungry after they vomit and they're high and they just, go on a trip together and that's how it's used. It was brought back to the US as a, I really won't go into that because I've been, <laughs> we'll just keep going. So toxic encephalopathy is one of the problems it can cause. Agitated delirium, which she had, rhabdomyolysis. She peaked at 45,000 CK, which is enormous. I hadn't seen a number like that since I took care of a jail patient who did, was in a squatting contest and he was somewhere in that range. Bradycardia is from the digitalis effects of the cambo toxin. Okay, so the treatment. What do you do when you don't know what you're doing? You call poison control. I call them literally for every one case, even if I know what I'm doing, because oftentimes they remind you of something you might've forgot. Like check the EKG, give them this, don't give them this. So they recommended Ativan as needed, soft restraints. Obviously, it was already there. Alter mental status panel and lots of fluids monitor the kidneys. So she came back from the urban jungle to see me. Her CK was too high, she needed it checked. It slowly descended from 30,000 to 13,000. And then when I saw her, 2,000. 
and her kidney function went back to normal, which was great because rhabdomyolysis can cause irreparable harm to your kidneys. Okay, second case. This was my level one trauma at C case. And the reason I'm talking to all of you today is because of this case. So let's talk about it. Um, I was surfing in 2013 with a woman on a surf diva trip. She was um, 50 years old. She was a divorcee. She was looking for love, snorkeling. We had all had gone surfing. She was the only one sort of snorkeling. I was, I acted as a solo doctor, party of one trauma team in a bikini in an underdeveloped country. I managed her care by performing multiple procedures and transfers, including ocean to island, island to mainland, and then evacuation to a jet to a developed country. She was in the wrong place at the wrong time. This is how accidents happen. Um, and she was in a boat channel, unofficial boat channel. She didn't have a buoy on. We were all surfing. No one knew she was there. The boatman didn't know. The boatman drove into the sun and he didn't see her. I fortunately was in the right place at the right time. So how do you save a life in an hour? There's a rule in ER medicine, it's the golden hour. You gotta get the ABCs right. You gotta get the fluids in or people die. And I'm just gonna read what I posted just because it's too long for me to tell you the story and it's much more succinct if I do this. So Dr. Bikini will save your life in the middle of the ocean when you get hit by a boat. I'll take you out of the ocean on a surfboard, turn into a backboard, tie off your exsanguinating wound with my rash guard, take you to my under-equipped urgent care, stabilize you in one hour with IV, oxygen, morphine, and fluids fully, and put you put your open femur fracture in Buck's traction, fly you by helicopter to a local hospital, and order, interpret all x-ray labs, CT scans, staple all your wounds, split your clavicle, humerus, and scapula, scapula fractures, sedate you, put a chest tube in your five rib fractured hemonumothorax, and fly you by a jet to a specialty hospital in another country. All, and you guessed it, my bikini. So I didn't plan on being famous. I really didn't. I just posted this picture because I was pissed off. So these are not the pictures of the actual event. I was practicing medicine in a third world, and I, oh God, I almost said third world country. I'm gonna get hate mail, in an undeveloped country. Um, there was no ID. I didn't show them that I was a doctor. Cash is king. We had to pay for our x-rays to be done before I could take them to the ICU to read them. This is a picture of the actual patient in the ICU. It's bare bones in these places. I don't think you can see your five rib fractures. They're much more clear on CT scan. Rib fractures are difficult to read on x-rays. Here, I believe you can see her humerus fracture, clavicle fracture, scapular fracture as well. That's a tough one to read. Uh, you have to see that on CT. Another view of the humerus fracture. Here we have the comminuted femur fracture. I've actually never seen the greater, greater trochanter up here. I don't know if anyone else will or has. And, and mind you, there was an open wound. I'm gonna just do a little circle that I could put several people's fist in on the outside where the propeller had gotten her. So originally the boat hit her on the head, then busted her shoulder and her chest, and then the propeller got her leg. So that's how she had ended up with an open fracture. This is what I actually looked like. I didn't look, you know, my hair wasn't all nicely coughed. Is that a word? I don't know. So just to review, I had one hour to make her better. I had one hour to get her fluids in, her pain medication, stabilize her open fractures. Femur fractures bleed out. You have to get them fluids. Her hemoglobin was eight by the time we got her to the hospital. Then I had 12 hours in the hospital. They brought me blood products. I didn't like the looks of them. They were warm. I'm glad I gave her IV fluids. Then you have to package her for a jet to Australia. I was up all night. This is like a 48 hour trip for me. This doesn't happen to any other surf doctors. This happens to me. So don't worry, just this is a once in a lifetime deal. Then she went back home. She spent two weeks. Oh, not, she didn't go back home. She went to Australia. She spent two weeks in Australia in the ICU. She had multiple surgeries to put everything back in place. And then one week she went home to her hospital and had multiple surgeries. She has recovered. As I said, I reenacted the story and untold stories. The photographs went viral on July 24th. I just had opened my account. Um, I posted at Dr. Candy's survival in response to the gender bias study of women's social media pro profile in the Journal of Vascular Surgery. They did a study that followed 460 surgical residents and found that women's but not men's social media profiles were unprofessional when they posed in bikinis, Halloween costumes, or drank alcohol. They even went on to propose 
that these female physicians would not be able to have a successful surgical practice if they posted these types of photos. I was outraged. And in my business, no one chooses to come see me in the ER. So, you know, it doesn't really affect me, but it affected all these other women's and I, women's, women's, and I just stood up in solidarity with them. And I just felt that, um, you know, women are being asked to hold their private image to a higher standard to be respected in the workplace. And my goal just became to collectively cancel sexism in 2020. And I need all of you to join me in this, men and women. So I went on from that post to think, oh my gosh, I don't want to be the spokeswoman for hashtag med bikini. I don't want to take credit for it. I did not start hashtag med bikini. And I'm sorry, I cannot remember her name, but there's a woman who did the first post. And I was just honestly cutting and pasting because I was upset and wanted to stand in solidarity. Um, I think it should be noted that um, we want medical professionals to be happy in their personal lives. Women physicians have a very high rate of suicide. We want them to wear bikinis and go to parties. Um, you know, your social media doesn't have to be a marketer measure your professional abilities. It just simply isn't true. So then I thought, well, how am I going to get everyone engaged? Well, when you want to get the other gender engaged, you don't alienate them, you bring them in. So I made all the doctors on my, my island, all the male doctors, dress up in Speedos and take pictures of themselves. And we put a picture of professional, not professional, just like this one. And then my dad, unfortunately, has passed away, but he's a heart surgeon. And I found a picture of him in a Speedo, which was not hard to do. He always wore it. He was a heart surgeon. In his free time, he liked gardening in a Speedo which is super embarrassing in the 80s, by the way, not in Europe. So Europeans won't understand what I'm saying right now. Um, that's him dressed up in his heart surgery gear. So honestly, the med bikini movement really made me realize that I need to be, that I was guilty of hiding my personal life from work to fear of being disciplined or fired. And I shouldn't be afraid of writing a book about it. A surf doctor and caring what people think of I think 300 followers to 35,000 followers minus the ones I lost last week from my political posts <laughs> and 266,000 likes so these are all the amazing men and women on the island who posed with me and you know our our voices need to speak as advocates of women's rights and we're just talking about equality of the sexes and the belief in social economic and political equality of the sexes. And that's the definition of feminism. It's not men hating, it's basically, we just wanna be included. And, and so my dad actually was a self-proclaimed feminist. He actually wrote it in one of his journals. Um, so we just, you know, we just don't wanna be treated as less than. And, and I hope all of you will, um, you know, rise up like we have with systemic racism that all genders need to rise up and fight together against systemic sexism. So I think I'm going a little bit, it looks like it's been about 45 minutes. So I'm just gonna wrap it up and just, you know, bring in how humor, you, we started making fun of the Sports Illustrated magazine. This is my funny husband's idea to do Science Illustrated and poke fun at people not believing in science and how to decrease pain scores with side boob and just, just trying to be silly and, and make it entertaining for people to join the movement. Um, and then, you know, I, I was going to talk a lot about this. I can if you want. I think it might go a little long, but it's just specific examples of sexism that I experienced as a medical student, a resident, and still today I do as an attending, standing up for myself um, on a regular basis, unfortunately. And then here's a few places where I've tried to make an impact. I created a med book Facebook page, sorry, med bikini Facebook page, where if you're experiencing sexism in the workplace, whether it's verbal, physical, financial, you can go to this site, you can get other people's input, talk about solutions. Um, I also started a web page for myself called Dr. Candy Survival. And I am gonna write my scandalous surf doctoring adventure book, um, which hopefully will be ready sometime next year. And I'm selling some t-shirts too, just to finance all these fun free talks, which I love to do. Um, and then just, you know, really it's all about just making everything inclusive, we can all wear whatever the hell we want in our, in our personal lives. It shouldn't impact your professional life. Um, and that's about it. I just leave it at that. And just, you know, I know it's so hard to be a med student. It's so hard to be a, a resident and also to be a new attending. 
we're, you're all going to wipe out. You just got to cherish your saves and just hopefully go home with more thank yous than F yous. And um, that's really the key. And humor, use humor. I can't emphasize that enough. It's really important to keep your sanity. That's what I got, ladies and gentlemen. I can only see two ladies, thankfully, or I think I would have needed for panel all to get through this talk. <laughs> No, that was awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Myrie. I think the messages you gave us all, especially as a woman and what we're going through in this time, like really resonates with us all. And I think Sarah Jacobson said it best in the chat. Thanks for being a badass woman and sharing that we can do what we love outside of the hospital. So thank you so much for your time. Um, if you guys have any questions, Tara is going to help us run the Q&A. So Tara, take it away. And thanks so once again, Dr. Myrie. That was an amazing talk. Well, thank you. All right, so if anyone does have any questions right now, they want to ask quick, quickly, you can like unmute, um, you know, speak up, talk to us, you can throw them in the chat. Uh, otherwise, we have two submitted questions prior. I have a quick question. Sure. Peter? Yeah, hi. Uh, I just thank you for your talk. I really appreciate it. Um, I was just wondering how you're able to kind of balance the schedule between, I'm sure you're working at like your home institution on the island and also like going abroad for your surf trips. How's that work? Well, let's talk pre 2020. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I usually would travel at least once to twice a year to go be a surf doctor. Um, I have a great gig at Tavarua where they want me to come every year and they actually prefer me to come for two weeks. So I built up to it, but I go for um, two weeks, twice a year to Tavarua. And honestly, that's been my mainstay for the last many years. If you want to go somewhere remote like Indonesia, I, two weeks is honestly too short depending on where you are uh, because it takes three days to get there and then time to acclimate mate. So I really would suggest more like three weeks for those type of trips. Um, it is hard though. I work a lot as an emergency doctor. I have huge student loans. I left with 400,000. I have 150 left. I, you know, don't want you to think it's all glamorous. A lot of my trips were just quick, quick trips down to Baja, but I have managed at least once a year to go somewhere new, like Nicaragua for a week and surf and bring supplies and volunteer. I work for surf divas in Costa Rica um, as their surf doctor. So I'm really just eking out like maybe four weeks a year, sometimes six weeks a year to go, and then just side trips in between. Because, you know, as a full-time emergency doctor, we only, you know, work anywhere from 15, I really full-time 15, 10, 12 hour shifts a month. Um, and I also, I worked urgent care my whole career. So it's, it's hard to block off that amount of time to be out of town. So it is difficult, but it's important. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. If anyone else has any other questions, now's the time. Uh, so I actually have a question. Um, are any of these opportunities that you've taken apart um, in, are any of them open to physician assistants by any chance? Hi, Nasheed. Yeah, I definitely think that they are. Um, I. It just, honestly, it's, it depends on where you are. Um, I know Tavarua is open to it because they also have EMTs, not just physicians. Um, I also know that a lot of the more remote places in Indonesia are open to it as well. I think it's just a skill set, honestly. Some of the people, some of the doctors who go on one of the trips don't even know how to suture. I mean, they do have ophthalmologists go sometimes. So um, I, I think your skill set's important for yourself because if you do have someone who does cut themselves and you don't know how to suture, then you're gonna to have to send them to the main land or maybe turn them away. Um, but honestly, you're volunteering your time on these places as a doctor or as a physician assistant or you know, as a nurse or whatever your healthcare worker status is. And that's very much appreciated. So there are opportunities out there and it's just all about networking, just finding the best fit for you. All right, thank you. Sure. So if I wanted to, I'm a nurse, well, and a medical student, but if I wanted to do something like the surf doctor thing with surf divas, would it, I have a girlfriend who's really amazing. She's a boat captain, she surfs, she's 
she's a nurse and like she would be kind of a travel partner I'd like to take with me if I was to do that would they be open to as a medical student me doing it with a nurse partner and as a nurse it really depends um obviously not right now but before um it, it's just honestly on a case-by-case -case basis on what they feel comfortable with and again you're volunteering your time so what you do is you just barter your services so you'll say you know I'll fly myself there, but you know, can you take care of my room and board and I'll be available for you if any emergency comes up. So um, it's really about that. And also you do, you, you want to volunteer and barter. You don't want to be paid because if there is something that does go wrong, which it does, you don't want to be legally accountable. Okay. Um, I think that's important too, but you know, there are a lot, so many, I don't even know of all the opportunities that exist right now. Um, I've just kind of stuck with the ones that work for me because I'm a known entity there. And honestly, I only had four weeks a year to, you know, I worked on my vacation basically because um, it was paid for um, by somebody else. And so that was my way that I would, could afford to go to Fiji. I didn't have, you know, to go to some of these places like the surf resort in Tavarua, it's $4,000 a week for one person. Oh. So oh your, your flight is, you know, 800 to $1,000. So you're still honestly, you know, taking, <laughs> taking yeah. a hit. Um, but yeah, if I hear of any other opportunities, I'll, I'll find a place where I can post and sort of re see if I can help research it for you if there are out there. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Great talk. Awesome. Any other questions? I have a question. Like it, it was a great talk, but my question is how frequently this kind of surf injury gets infected? And have you ever heard that, you know, you fix the wound right there and the patient are coming back with severe sepsis or something like that? It's only happened one time. Um, what I generally do, and obviously no one will ever advise you to do this, but these people go, these are once in a lifetime surfing trips. They're very expensive. People have dreamed about going to Fiji to surf or the Mentawes. I suture them. And oftentimes I glue on top of the sutures. I put them on antibiotics and I send them back out there. I've done that multiple times. It's worked for me. The only time it did not work is when I had a laceration to the back of the heel. And unfortunately I couldn't feel or see that the Achilles tendon was lacerated. I sewed them up. I said, it's your choice. I, I obviously tell them conservatively, you should not go back in the water until this is healed, but you're on a surf trip. This is what I can do for you. So he went back out, his wound became infected. He went home, the tendon became infected. Um, they repaired it. And then a month later he was skateboarding and his tendon snapped and he had an Achilles tendon rupture. And unfortunately I had put him on Cipro because that's the only medication we had in the cabin at that time. And Cipro does have a known association with Achilles tendon rupture. That's my only case that I know of in 14 years. Everyone else I've sewed has reached out to me. They haven't become infected surfing right after stitches. Some people have popped stitches, but that was a professional surfer who did a deep knee bend in the tube. So I just said, you're on your own. I sewed it once, and <laughs> I'm not sewing it twice. Um, but it's, it's really uncommon, honestly. I've, I've been surprised. Okay, thank you. Sure. So I have a question. I'd really love to solicit your opinion on how we as medical students can confront some of these sexist uh, views on us when we're more likely dealing with our superiors um, and how you might have navigated that in the past when dealing with someone who's above you exhibiting these uh, ideas and kind of blatant sexism. This is a great question. I do have an experience in this, unfortunately. So we had internal um, introduction to clinical medicine as a third year medical student. It was a volunteer attending. He would harass me every time, say something sexual to me, but it was very subtle. He asked me a question one day. He said, what is the finger most injured on the hand? And I knew the answer, it was the thumb. But instead I did this. And that's because I was done, I was done. And he's like, that's the wrong answer and now you're in trouble. So I. I knew it was interfering with my work already. I went straight to the Dean uh, at Keck and he disciplined that um, attending and he was a volunteer, he was fired. It's not so easy as a resident. It's not so easy as an attending. 
Um, it's happened to me multiple times as a resident. I had a hyperbaric chamber doctor who would say inappropriate sexual things to me on a recorded line while I was taking care of a chamber patient in Catalina Island. I never said anything because it was too hard. I was one of two female residents in a class of 18. The ER was a very male-based profession. I just kept quiet. I most recently had a vascular surgeon on a speakerphone while I had my hand in an exsanguinating dialysis shunt bleeding that I needed emergent transfer. Tell me on a speakerphone while there's 10 other people in the room not to be scared and what was he gonna do, fly over there and help me. I mean, these are three of the highlights. And that was as me as an attending at you know 15 years. I, and I, I told him, I assure you I'm not scared. And I reported him to the VP of my ER group. And she said, you know, she kind of said boys will be boys. She said, that just happens sometimes. You just gotta just keep keep on keeping on. So that's kind of what encouraged me to make this space, this med bikini page on Facebook and give us a forum because we need to figure out how to bring these things up safely so it doesn't, it doesn't hurt our career. And so far I haven't figured that out to be honest. And I do bring it up often. Um, but in that case, there's no action taken. I, I would say document, document, document. Location, times, words, if you can get a video recording, <laughs> if you can get, I think that's the answer. Honestly, unfortunately, we're going to have to keep track and we're going to have to talk to each other and use our, you know, RBG lawyer resources if we need to. Thank you so much. Sure. All right, we're about almost 10 minutes over. So if there are any burning last minute questions, I think we will go ahead and wrap things up. Um, thank you everybody so much for coming. This talk was amazing, Dr. Myrie. Thank you. Inspirational all around. Thank you for being here. Um, if you guys have any questions you think of later, feel free to email them to me and we can get those answers to you. Um, but otherwise, I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your days and bye. Thanks Thank so you. much, everyone. Be more amazing. Thank you, Dr. Myrie. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.